right, perfect. Okay. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our first webinar of 2024. It's great to be back after our little summer break, and thank you for jumping on tonight um, and joining us. Uh, my name is Katie Grayson, and I will be hosting this webinar presented by the Wildflower Society of Western Australia. Our webinar today is presented and recorded on Noongar country and the Wildflower Society would like to pay our respects and acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land where we are hosting the Woodjuk people. We also acknowledge and recognise the traditional custodians of the different lands where everyone joins us from. Uh, so again, thank you everyone for reserving tickets and joining us tonight. It's always so great to see all the interest in WA's environment and all the support as well. Uh, just a little housekeeping before we begin, uh, a little reminder that we that when you do reserve tickets for the webinars, the number of tickets you reserve is not for how many people are joining the webinar, uh, but it's for how many devices are logged on. So, for example, if you have four people joining on your on your one screen, then that's not four tickets. It's still only one ticket um, just because we have a capacity for 100 users to be on at the same time. So we just want to make sure everyone can um, log on if they want and no one can miss out. So please just make sure you only reserve one ticket for the amount of users that are watching, um, not the amount of people. Uh, so tonight's presentation will go for around 45 minutes where we will, of course, conclude with some Q&A. Uh, and feel free to send your questions in as the presentation goes. So we don't want anyone forgetting as we go. Um, and then during the Q&A, if you'd want to ask the question yourself um, aloud, then please feel free and you can just raise your hand in the toolbar and we can unmute you so you can ask yourself. And uh, hopefully we don't run into any technical issues, but if any do come up, please just contact the email address as usual that is listed on the events page or respond to any of the emails you've gotten about this and then we can get back to you as soon as we can and fingers crossed we can <laughs> sort out any issues. Uh, so we are very lucky to be joined by our guest speaker this month, Greg Keery. In light of World Wetlands Day at the beginning of February, we asked Greg to join us for this month's webinar and to present their talk, Water is Life in Our Dry State. Greg was the Senior Principal Research Scientist at DBCA, has surveyed and sampled across the whole of Western Australia and played a major role in putting the southwest of WA on the map for being a biodiversity hotspot. With Greg's incredible contribution to WA Botany, earning many plants named after him, uh, Greg and his wife Bronwyn were awarded Medals of the Order of Australia for service to conservation and the environment in 2020. He has contributed more than 32,000 species to the Western Australia Herbarium, and recognition of this of his contribution includes earning the Outstanding Service Award from the Wildflower Society of WA in 2005 and the Australian Plants Medal from the Australian Native Plant Society in 1999. This doesn't even touch the surface of the profound impact Greg has had on conservation, but it's all we have time for right now. Um, tonight's presentation has been inspired by Greg and Bronwyn's work in Julemar Conservation Park through the Wildflower Society Plant Survey Program. Julemar is part of the Northern Jarrah Forest Bioregion and Greg will talk about the differences between the wetlands of the Northern Jarrah Forest and Swan Coastal Plain bioregions, among many other things. But that's enough from me and I'll hand you over to Greg to begin their presentation for the night. Thanks, Greg. Thank you very much, Katie. Um... Yes, as Katie said, this was inspired by our work in a really wonderful part of WA, which is Julemar State Forest, and which should have been a long time ago, Julemar Conservation Park. That photograph there is the headwaters of the Brockman River, um, one of the many streams that start in Julemar. One thing we noticed when we started working in Julemar um, was the contrast between the bioregion of the Swan Coastal Plain, which we knew very well, and also the bioregion of the Jarrah Forest. They are very different areas, divided. Um, one is basically sands, and the other, of course, is laterites and granites and some sands, but a very different um, climate in many ways um, compared to the coastal plain, even though the rainfall is quite similar. 
Um, and we thought we got interested in looking at a comparison between what the Swan Coastal Plain is and a place we know very well and the Jarrah Forest. So we're going to talk about the wetland plants. The wetlands of the Northern Jarrah Forest and Northern Jarrah Forest starts around Collie and runs up to Julema. Um, the Southern Jarrah Forest goes from Collie down and meets the Carry Forest. So it's the wet part of the Jarrah Forest. This is the drier part. So we'll talk about the current state of knowledge and a comparison between the coastal plain and the Jarrah Forest. Some things of past listings of what were the wetland types of each region based on the biodiversity audit in 2003, the last one that was officially publicly published. Some thing about some of the very interesting wetland types in each bioregion, and also the significance of wetlands in Western Australia to both touristic that is vegetation types and specific richness, species richness for areas and also communities, and some of the knowledge gaps and a couple of conclusions um, based on some of this um, work in progress. So what are wetland and dryland plants? They're sort of easy to say. But you'd think it's fairly obvious, but it often isn't in a relatively dry climate. In WA, we have major... The major division in plants normally when you're looking at vegetation is that there are the two habitats, there's wet and there's dry, and plants tend to either grow in wet and dry places, so you get very different vegetation communities, very different species, but some things are general. They will grow both in wet, dry soil. Um, when you look at the top of this slide, you can notice the wet part is where the water in the soil is waterlogged. It doesn't necessarily have to have free water. It can come up to the surface, but not be wet for that long. And that's a feature of a dry climate that we have. So it's wet in winter, some of them, or the middle one, it can be waterlogged, or there's the dry part on either side. And people probably know that our water is largely sourced from rain, which then forms, of course, a groundwater component, and most of that flows from the inland to the sea. Frequently in wetland habitats is an impeding layer which keeps the water in the soil for longer. We have very freely draining soils in many parts of WA, so an impeding layer is quite often quite essential to get keep a wetland wet. And we're again as because of our climate being Mediterranean in the southwest, we have a major seasonal cycle of waterlogging, and that results in this series of habitats. So you'll have things like Melaleuca lateritia, the robin redbreast um, bush on the left, which is pretty well typical of wet, seasonally wet habitats. Verticordia nightens can actually cope pretty much with the both. Um, or you get things like Mary, which likes a higher water table but essentially likes a dry soil. So on top of all of these basic things, you also, of course, have quite different soil types. You, we don't really have any clays in WA, but we do have some areas with more clay in the soil. Those wetland types tend to have more clay in the soil. There are um, international classifications of wetlands that are used right throughout the world. We don't tend to use most of these in Western Australia. We tend to call things swamps, and the red dots you can see on your screen essentially correspond to what we call swamps. So if there's, and well, the wetlands are classified on landform and hydro period. So landform can be a basin, um, which is like the one in the middle, the Brixton Street wetlands, or they can be a channel, which is a river, a creek, or a wadi. Um, or they can be flat. They can be a floodplain, which makes sense. Or the most interesting ones in some ways are the slopes and the highlands. Uh, the one on the right is actually a palace slope wetland. Palace monts are quite rare, and they tend to be things like the um, peat swamps, the peat mounds, or the mound springs you get around um, Perth or some of the mound springs you get which have um, reed ear and things in them you've probably heard about in the carry forests, the much wetter parts of the state. We do have, essentially in WA, we have lakes, sump lands. We don't have really any players. That's arid zone. We don't have wadis or bakaras. 
But we do have damp lands, palace plains, palace slope, slide plains, and sump lands. And they're our essential wetlands types. Just to illustrate what does happen mostly in Western Australia, just to make you realise that we have uplands. Here, this is Brixton Street, place really known, you know very well, a, a state recognised wetland, a nationally recognised wetland, and probably something that should be a Ramsar wetland. Um, the Brixton Street wetlands, as you probably know, have over 600 species of native flowering plants within a very small area, and they're an indication of just how rich having wetlands, a diverse range of wetlands within an area can make the flora. So we have the uplands, the Murray woodlands. We have these wet flats, which are dominated here by Vimineria, a really amazing tea. These are the um, shrubs above the white um, pimelia here. Vimineria has both, um, it can re-sprout, some killed, some re-sprout, some actually have epicormic shoots. Plants have roots which are either have nodules, they have nodules, proteoid roots, and pneumatophores. To, so it's a remarkable species right across southern Australia. Then we go around to the really wet parts where there is actually water in winter, where Melaleuca lateritia is, and in summer we have a waterlogged soil which gives you a whole range of things. So Brixton Street has perch wetlands, known as vernal pools. It has an impeding clay layer underneath, or it has ironstone and or limestone as the impeding layer. It has a cycle of water, a regular water cycle and regular water logging, and a variety of soil. And that's what makes it a mega diverse bushland area, well known as a feature on the um, southern Swan Coastal Plain. One of the things that we've noticed in the Jarrah Forest, and something I was certainly not aware of until I actually did some reading of um, some of the geological work, is there are a lot of groundwater seeps in the Jarrah Forest. These are palace slope wetlands. And what happens for these, they're on a slope, like it's shown here in Julemar. You have an area that's a saturated layer of water. Something breaks it out and the water table comes out to the surface, and it can be just from literally a break in the um, ground, or it can be in a saturated layer that just seeps at the bottom of sand. That's what tends to happen on the coastal plain and forms these um, mound springs. You get a dike in that you can get something like a basalt impeding section that stops it, or just a change in slope. We've found that groundwater seeps are really unrecognised and very significant component of the northern Jarrah forest. We suspect, given what they do in Julemar, they tend to stop having trees in the area. You can see behind the middle photograph, there is quite a nice Jarrah woodland, but they're all shrubs and herbs, very, very diverse and very rich in many very unusual herbs and shrubs. So there are major feature that I certainly wasn't aware of till we started working in Julemar, and they probably are a major feature of the northern Jarrah Forest. Now in 2003, there was the published biodiversity audit. They did each of the um, biogeographic regions and looked at the aspects of the biodiversity and the threats and things to those regions. Now, for the northern Jarrah Forest, when they looked at the wetlands, they essentially listed these wetlands, granite outcrops, the edges of those, which are very wet in winter, and then they form refugia. There's a picture of a granite outcrop there, and the beginnings of the Brockman River there are also on granite. So they called them refugial areas. They found some freshwater wetlands up there with um, reed beds, the Barmia, which is now Mascherina reed beds. They had a number of wetlands of national significance known from the northern Barrow Forest. And they were the Avon River Valley and the Chittering Nodonga Lakes. If you go up to um, Bindoon, that's Lake Chittering just south of Bindoon. Of sub-regional significance, or in other words, state significance, all the rivers of the northern Jarrah Forest were given as being um, of great significance for um, biodiversity. So they are all the rivers, but of these, when you look at it, only the more the Brockman, the Swan and the Murray haven't got dams on them. So there are some significant issues, of course, with the use of the Northern Jarrah Forest for the water supply for Perth, 
and for irrigation. So that's had a number of um, effects on the biodiversity and the functioning of those rivers. As a different example, the biodiversity audit for the Swan Coastal Plain, um, there was a lot more work had been done on wetlands of the Swan Coastal Plain, both from the Department of Environmental Protection many years ago and with their lakes policy and with their wetlands policy to actually map and, and with the Department of Water as well. So there was a lot more known about the wetlands on the coastal plain. They had 25 wetlands of national significance listed for the coastal plain in 2003. They were lakes, Booragoon, Forest Hill, Garuga, Herdsman's, Karakin, Joondala. You can see them, Lake Thetis, which is up at um, Cervantes, which has stromatolites in it, Loch McNess, Rottnest, the Rottnest, really amazing lakes, the Spectacles wetlands, Thompson's Lake, the Vaswanara, which is a Ramsar wetland, and the Yelgara wetland. So really a large and comprehensive list with many, many, many biodiversity values. And they also had quite a few swamps listed, such as Picture Point, which is a threatened community now, Rixton Street, the Benja wetlands, the Gibbs Road system, Mackay's Swamp in Ludlow, and significantly Perth Airport. They had a couple of rivers, not very many. Chandala and Allen Brooks were really the only rivers, and there were the Peel Harvey and the Swan Canning estuaries. Swan, this Peel Harvey is a Ramsar wetland as well. It's pretty obvious that you don't get estuaries in the Jarrah Forest, um, so you could say that's a feature of the Swan Coastal Plain that will never be shared or seen in the Jarrah Forest. So the northern Jarrah Forest wetland types, what have we found by looking through aspects of the northern Jarrah forest? Well, we know in the channel wetlands, there are certainly some permanent lakes and rivers during, and which were listed. There were some seasonal creeks. There's quite a lot of floodplains, which didn't seem to get into the biodiversity audit. For the basins, there are some naturally saline lake sump stamp lands and wetlands, which are not listed. The naturally fresh ones tended to be the lakes, but the seasonal wetlands really didn't get much of a sea in. The damp lands, the palace plains and the palace slopes. And the granite rocks did. But the thing about granite rocks is they're not just a refugia. They are in their own right. The mosh wards and granite rocks are a unique form of a wetland. And the fringing creeks and damp lands are very significant and very species rich. So there were quite a lot of things that weren't really picked up in the 2003 audit. The Swan Coast Plain, however, was, as we've said, was probably much better known. The channel wetlands were pretty well all recorded, the permanent ones, the rivers, the estuaries. Many of the seasonal creeks and floodplains were listed. And for the basins, though, there was somewhat of a limited representation. The naturally saline permanent lakes were listed, Lake Gulungup, the Wollongup, the Rottnest Island Lakes, and some of the seasonal sump lands. The naturally fresh, the permanent lakes were, the seasonal damp lands and palace plains, but the palace slopes which form the um, mound springs, which we get at New Cheyenne areas, uh, which are now a threatened community, actually weren't picked up within the biodiversity audit, but they have been done since. So what makes the Jarrah, Northern Jarrah Forest, the wetlands really important for um, floral biodiversity for plants, basically. I'm basically now talking about plants, although they are obviously pretty important for um, fauna as well, but I'll just concentrate on the plants. They are refugia and corridors. Um, the wetlands are themselves a hydrological refugia. They are places which are more wet than the surrounding places. So the fringes of granite outcrops are swamps, the winter wet valley floors and the boundaries of streams and rivers. They were picked up as being a really significant refugia in the northern Jarrah forest. But one of the things that they did miss was what we found in the biodiversity survey of the WA Agricultural Zone, that at the intersection between the wheat belt, that many terrestrial species like Bossieria carp are shown here, at the eastern margin of their ranges occur in damp lands or along rivers or valley floors. 
And this was well shown in the biodiversity survey of the agricultural zone. And these valley floors, these broad valley floors out in the eastern side of the Jarrah Forest are greatly at risk from salination. And this seems to be greatly undervalued. Um, we have many recovery catchments, but these broad valley floors, which have got a longer um, er period of inundation, it enables species which would normally not grow in such relatively dry areas to survive there seems to me to be a very important um, both refugia and increase in biodiversity and something where the plants if it gets wetter would head further east if it gets drier will contract back further west the other thing that wasn't picked up that i think are uh, um, very significant and very very significant in the northern jarrah forest are the high rainfall scarp valleys if you look at a rainfall, the Orenfall Isa Heights, the 1,000 mil Isa height runs up the Darling Scarp up to about dwelling up, but the effects of this increased rainfall um, extends right up to Armadale. The area within the Scarp Valleys have about 20, at least 20 species at their northern range, ranging from these large trees like Banksia semi nuda, which is a tree up to 20 metres tall, the big, tallest and biggest Banksia we have, right through to small shrubs like Dampiera heteracea, the Cary Dampiera, or to the um, Cary forest then Patasonia, the yellow Patasonia, Patasonia xanthina. This has a very high species diversity, and the high species diversity of this area really contributes markedly to the Perth region being considered a national biodiversity hotspot. Um, and for example, some of this has been lost, um, for example, the Albany um, daisy, Albany swamp daisy, Actinodium cunninghamii, in the 1890s was recorded just south of Armadale, and now it's only recorded about at Bunbury. So there has been um, probably the, um, a large amount of clearing has occurred around these valleys, um, and the threats currently really are obviously climate change. Dams are a threat to them because they reduce the water siltation coming along the rivers and from mining, and also weeds because they're wetter in areas where weeds do a lot better. So they, they're really a major feature that I think nobody should underestimate just how important those wetlands are to the maintenance of species diversity in the northern Jarrah forest. What happens on the coastal plain for rivers and estuaries? They are again both refugia and corridors. Interestingly enough, we've found their major corridors. They allow many species to penetrate from the better soils of the Jarrah Forest right down towards the coast. And for example, we've found the native yam, which was of incredible importance to the um, Noongar peoples, um, gets down to Kings Park in the areas along the rivers. And it probably, probably were a feature along those rivers which the Noongar people used as they came to the coast in summer. That goes the reverse way too. Tuat runs up the rivers from the coast. In fact, there were Tuat populations at lowlands near Serpentine, and there were Tuat populations once around Guildford. So species from the coast also go inland up the rivers. We're not quite sure how this works, but it certainly does work. They are corridors and refugia. Saline adapted flora, including the um, threatened ecological communities, the salt marshes occur in the coastal plain, and there are northern taxa found in these estuarine and riverine sites, which includes Avicennia marina, the white mangrove found at Bunbury. The nearest populations are on the Abrolla, some 400 kilometres north of there. They certainly are refugia. We've found on the Peel Harvey dunes on the eastern side of the Peel Harvey inlet a reasonable number of wheat belt taxa, including Atroplex subarecta, Menke australis, and Central Lepus eremica. Things we would normally expect to find way east of northern are found there, and there probably were more in the past um, before the disturbance. So, corridors and refugia also are a series of unique old lagoons, such as Lake Coolangup and Wollongup, which have a very interesting and very diverse flora found nowhere else in the coastal plain. The Jarrah Forest, I 
suspect, and I think it's true, that the Jarrah Forest wetlands are relatively poorly documented. We know there's poorly documented seep wetlands, and that's a picture of a hillside seep with um, the rare conosperm and subspecies Unicephalatum, um, which is dominates parts of the areas in Julemar. One rare way you can tell that the northern Jarrah Forest region has 317 priority flora, in other words, flora which are perhaps need conservation listing. And 84 of these those are confined to wetlands. So a large number of the priority flora of the northern Jarrah Forest are wetland species. Of the 59 declared endangered or threatened, 17 of these are in wetlands. So about a third of the species the northern Jarrah forest are found, the rare ones are found only in wetlands. So the hillside seeps, as I've said, the palace slate ones prevent tree establishment, probably because of the impeding layer and the rather unusual large amounts of water. And they do contain a diverse and unusual range of shrub species. And this picture in Julemar here, you can see they really are very pretty sites. They're full of verticordias, We've got, in fact, one of those yellow ones there doesn't seem to match any known verticordia, but we get up to five species of um, feather flowers, verticordias, in these hillside seep sites. So they're really rich in species and really unusual species. The other thing you get in there also, as well as you get on the coastal plain, we do get these um, basin wetlands, which are quite similar, although different, to what you get at Brixton Street. This is one in Julemar, and you can see it's got Melaleuca vimania here, but they do also have Melaleuca lateritia. Um, they're clay-based sump lands, and they contain a wide variety of endemic and highly localised plant species, including some myriocephaluses. That's an Iliacaris named after somebody or other. That's declared rare. Um, the myriocephalus, that's myrios, uh, little daisies, that's the common oxidentalis. There he is again next to it. the yellow flowered um, myriocephalus nudus shown here. And that was a species which until last year was considered to be extinct. It had not been seen since Drummond collected the type in 1849. So that's in one only one basin wetland in the northern Jarrah Forest. And it's perhaps an indication of just how much more we need to know or have got to learn about the northern Jarrah forest. And the picture on the side is actually that brown there is the dried off seed heads of Myriocephalus nudus. So that was a really exciting find from last year found by the Swan region who were doing transects through that wetland because they were having problems with four wheel drivers. And I, See, they asked me if there are any really potentially unusual things that they should keep an eye out for, and I showed them the drawings of the type of this, and Grasnia, the lady who was doing these transects, had picked up one of these on the transect, because she said, I think I know what that is, and brought in the specimen, and lo and behold, it was something that we haven't seen for 150 years. What are the other sorts of basin wetlands? There are sand-based damp lands, which are especially common in the area west of Bindoon, um, not Bindoon, Brookton. And they have some quite a lot of disjunct wetland species, which are often found in the northern sand plains. And this is one of the most beautiful ones. This is Biblis gigantea. Biblis gigantea is just about fading out in the Perth area. Um, it used to be a common species from Jandicott up through to about Jinjin, but it's really become very uncommon. And its area where it's mainly hanging out now is, in fact, the northern Jarrah Forest. And it would be really interesting because these are disjunct populations to do some detailed genetic studies on these to see how variable and how different they are from the ones on the coastal plain. There also are, as I've said, an awful lot of floodplain areas, which again, this is an area of clay-based sort of wetlands in uh, Jarrah Forest, in the Wandu Forest, sorry, in Julemar. These flats, again, have really no tree cover. Not quite sure why, but they have no tree cover, but an awful lot of very unusual herbs. The most 
dominant one there is this small Conostolus, Conostolus prolifera, um, but they also have a range of very strange eryngiums, the devils, um, and we're not sure what that one is. It's one from Julemar. I can't place it readily within uh, one of the um, subspecies of Pinnatophetum currently. So clay-based damplands and floodplains are, again, species diverse in shrubs and herbs, quite unlike the rest of the Jarrah forest. Now, what is one of the main features of, I think, of our wetlands is that is not frequently talked about and not well known, but is becoming better known, is the fact that many of the wetlands have very species, have very distinct, what we call ecotypes. They can be morphologically different or physiologically different, but things that grow in the wetlands are often quite reasonably separable from things that grow as uplands. And this is one that actually has been named. This is the upland version of Patasonia occidentalis, which is Patasonia occidentalis var occidentalis. And this is the wetland form, which is a much, got much thinner leaves, long, thin stems. Flowers are pretty much the same, but they are really quite different. And they've been recognized as being two distinct varieties of the one species. So that's something that's happening more commonly. Um, there are a large number of them which are unnamed, however. And this was what was Vallea trinervus in the um, granite rocks and in the Jarrah forest in many areas. They are bright orange yellow with a red centre. The ones on the clay base wetlands are called the pale form, where they tend to be completely hairless quite large spreading plants, and you can see very pale orange flowers with a very pale purple um, nectar guide rather than the bright red one. That's almost certainly a different taxon, um, but there are a number of these within that species and they are not named yet. So what are some of the conclusions one can come from this? In many ways, people just think of wetlands as limited specialised habitats or as refugia for drying times. They are certainly both, um, and they will be refugia in climate change too, although they're both threatened by climate change. But our wetlands have a great diversity. They are common, um, although they are obviously scattered, and they contribute to plant biodiversity at all levels vegetation, species, genetics, as I've shown, I hope. The, I feel the wetlands in the northern Jarrah Forest and probably the southern Jarrah Forest really do need urgent floristic survey. You can see here about the um, signs that go up around Julemar, and that's one that was done also for the wetland with the myriocephalus. One of the problems is they do have problems with four-wheel driving and motorbikes, and they are hard to keep things out of them so they're quite fragile systems even though they are pretty amazing systems. One of the things I'd really like to see and I did in the um, wetlands conference and on World Wetlands Day is I reckon we should give our clay-based systems like Brixton Street or Julemar, the ones that are right through Perth especially, they should give them a name of their own. South Africa's name theirs, they are a feature of um, Mediterranean climates. They're, South Africa calls them flays. California, they're called vernal pools. I think it would be really great if we had a local indigenous name for our local and unique clay pans so they got a better area of publicity and people actually thought more of them as being how uniquely West Australian they are. So essentially, thanks to really all the people who've worked in Jarrah Forest Wetlands, which is the Wildflower Society Bushland Survey Program people, certainly Grasnia from the Swan Region, the Swan Region Hills District who've helped us in many of these surveys, and all the people who've worked on the coastal plain over the past three decades with us. There are a number of websites with detailed information on wetlands and wetlands plants, um, not least of which, of course, is the recently released um, book on um, growing locals, which in the back section of that we've compiled with Vanda Longman and Barbara Rye, a list of what 
plants are in what areas and with special details on which wetland ones have actually completely separate wetland forms. So that's just come out. But there's also the um, DVCA, the text files for, the, um, for details of the Swan Coastal Plain Survey. There's the mapping layers on the state land information package in that thing. And there's the Perth plant biodiversity sites, which you can go to to actually see plant community reference sites. And that is me. Perfect. Thank you, Greg. That was incredible. I can't believe just how much I think is unknown and how many even plant species are left to be surveyed and named. And it's pretty incredible. It's a crazy thought to think that we don't have um enough protection for these areas and something like that. I just can't can't believe it. <laughs> well, we still have about 10% of our flora we guesstimate as unnamed. So in yeah. the flora of 12,000 species, that makes over a thousand species still to go. So there's anybody who's younger than me, much younger than me, that's your job. <laughs> that is the hope of the future is that people will continue to work on um the, we just the more we look, the more we find. And it's that's remarkable, but true. Yeah, some good aspirations for our young botanists out there. <laughs> they can they can get to naming the other 10% of the flora. <laughs> Um, for everyone, anyone that has any questions, please make sure you send them through. I can't think of someone who's more qualified and ready to answer some of some of these questions. Um, there's probably no better time to send them through either. So please send them through. Feel free to send them in the chat box or put your hand up and we can unmute your mic and you can ask them yourself as well. Is there anything you're um working yeah, on at the moment? Oh, sorry, what was that? Maybe I scared them all off. Yeah. <laughs> There's too much unknown out there. <laughs> Have you got any uh, projects that you're working on at the moment? We are still working on Julemar. Um, we are now, just for one interesting bit, Julemar conservation park which it should be we're now up to a bit over 630 native species in Julemar in the forest area um, I would guesstimate by the end of the survey it'll be over 800 um, so it'll be the northern Jarrah forest the Perth area now the PMR since when we did the last add up for the book on growing locals is now up to 1800 species 1800 native species in the, our region where we live, and the whole of the UK has about 2,000. So the Perth area itself has got as more as many native species as the whole of Great Britain. Wow. And that could be something that in, would make you really realise we do live in a, an amazing place. Yeah, definitely. I've got a um, hand raised from Andrew, so I'm just going to unmute Andrew and they can ask. I thank you very much indeed for a wonderful talk, Greg. Um, can I just ask um, the branch whether um, how we could get um, uh, the text of the of those websites you put on the last slide so that we can continue to learn more? Or would you be putting your slides on? Oh, to... actually, oh, yeah. um. We could either, I suppose, put it on the website, couldn't we, Katie or Brett? What do you? Yeah, yeah. Well, we um yes. the webinar is recorded and uploaded to our Facebook um yeah. and YouTube channel, so um feel free to get them off of there. Um, and then we can even put them in the description of um when we upload them if that's helpful. So you can just copy and paste those links. That's yep. the main society webpage you're talking about. Um, no, so that'll be um, done through our, the Society's YouTube channel and the Society's Facebook um, page. But um, since okay. you attended tonight, so the links for the, the webinar, uploaded yeah. webinar, will be sent out tomorrow. So you'll be on okay. the list for that. And then Thank you, you very much. No worries. Thanks for asking. Thank you. Um, and I've got a hand from Geraldine as well. 
Um, oh, hi. Yeah, I've um, worked in the wetlands um, the, on the uh, south coast amongst uh, a lot of the saline wetlands. And I was just wondering, do you have any sort of references that are sort of more recent on uh, the Karelis that occur in um, these wetlands? I, not me, but I do know Michelle Casanova, who you may know, who works on, uh, who's currently yeah. advising Karelis for Australia. Michelle is due here as long as we get some rain this year. So she's still actively working on the car alias of Australia. Okay. Um, and I would suspect if you just Google Michelle Casanova, you'll probably find more on car than you ever. I mean, they're an amazing group of, these are actually a calcareous um, green algae, which are probably very close relatives to the vascular plants. Um, so they're, rich and diverse aren't they in yeah. in i think michelle's just done the arid zone ones but they're rich and diverse right across australia especially in the arid zone or the arid tropics and in the southwest so um if any of you are interested in them and they are a, a really and michelle would love people to collect her material good material because it's hard to get that, I think that would make sense, wouldn't it, Geraldine? She certainly... Yeah, yeah thank you, then. Thank yes. you, yeah, I will follow that up. I wasn't sure. Mm. I have no, seen... She'd love to, she would love to hear from you, especially if you're anywhere near a puddle that's got car racy in it. Um, good one. Okay, then I'll contact her. Thank you very much and for an informative talk too. Perfect. Thanks, Geraldine. I've got um, Brian as well who wants to ask a question. Uh, Greg, uh, thanks very much for that. I really enjoyed it and learned so much. But one question and one thing I have learned, I didn't realise that the northern Jarrah forest starts from Collie. So does that mean another characteristic of the northern Jarrah forest is the, the bauxite? That there, there isn't bauxite in the southern Jarrah forest? Or... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Your... It, there is more solid laterite. It breaks. The laterite cap essentially breaks up, probably as you know, in the wheat belt. It becomes much more dissected. So those um, mesas and sort of places in the wheat belt, and it's solid in the northern Jarrah forest right up to Julemar. Um, no, it, it definitely, when you hit Collie, the Collie basin is Permian. So it's a much older um, surface, and that's the big break. So north, you've got tertiary laterites. Once you get down towards the high rainfall areas in Collie, you get the Collie Basin, which are per were Permian um, 200 and something million years ago, and that's where the coal deposits from Gondwana are. So, yeah, you're quite right. There's a major, both a, a big rainfall difference, but a major geological difference between the two subregions. But then Jarrah can grow, obviously, in... With obviously the northern Jarrah forest with the with those laterites and made up of the um, uh, the bauxite, but they can also Jarrah can also grow in the in the coal basin and further south. So it, yeah, is it yeah. just the same exactly the same Jarrah, or is there some subtle difference? <laughs> it, Jarrah, once you get in the higher rainfall areas around or around Lake Muir and areas, grows on virtually every soil type there is. Um, in the northern Jarrah forest, it tends to be mainly on the laterites. It's on the coastal plain on the spearwood sands, which are the ones, you know, the ones, the yellow sand plain that you, over limestone, which is nutriently better. The genetics of it, um, now let me think, the big, big trees tend to have low levels of genetic variability. And the studies on Jarrah have shown that the one on the coastal plain the one that they call pink jarrah, the guys who make wood out of it, um, that tends to be genetically more different than all of the ones on the um, plateau. And there's another group which are different down on the Blackwood Plateau, which is the jarrah forest 
which sits on the area near Margaret River. So there are three main genetic blobs, I suppose you could say, in Jarrah. There's the coastal plain Jarrahs, the northern Jarrahs, and then the um, Jarrah that's down around Bustleton, Augusta sort of area. But they mm. are relatively small genetic differences because these very long-lived trees seem to have lower levels of genetic variability than some of the smaller things. And I think that's the correct way. There's the three big groups of them. And Thanks the blue flower has no real difference. Thanks very much, yeah. Perfect. Thanks for that, Brian. I've got Colmar as well with their hand up. Sorry. Thank you. Um, thanks, Greg. Fascinating and overwhelming information. Thank you. Um, my question is about you mentioned there was the need for urgent urgent floristic survey of certainly the northern Jarrah forest and also you said probably the southern Jarrah forest too about particularly these wetlands and damp lands and things. So how do we assist in alerting the government that that needs to be done? Well, theoretically, for the regional forest assessment, there was meant to be a major floristic survey, but most of that never quite happened. I suppose that would be a way to put it. Um, I think when the... I'm not sure what's going to happen with the Commonwealth, um, but I would assume that the Commonwealth, the new um, legislation that's coming through, that perhaps, and also now that the government has decided not to do logging through the Jarrah Forest, um, the next one, the next regional forest agreement will probably be the time I would suspect where you could perhaps lobby them to do a better job of trying to work out what to do about the variation within the Jarrah forest proper. Um, that's just a guesstimate, um, because in the past, essentially, it's been thought that the Jarrah forest was reasonably well protected by being all state forest. Now, we know that that doesn't stop a whole lot of um, issues, and a whole lot of it probably needs to be sorted out best as to what's the um, comprehensive and adequate and representative um, reserve network through the forest and the only real way to do that is to do a proper floristic survey and a proper faunal survey through the forest to get a proper reserve network you really do need a proper floristic study done through the northern and southern Jarrah forest i think the carry is pretty well known um, they have done a lot of floristic work through the carry but certainly not through the Jarrah forest so to get a car reserve network that's what you need and if there's any mention of a car reserve network, that's the time to um, say this is what you do need for the northern Jarrah forest. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes, thank you. Perfect. Thanks for that, Colma. Um, Michelle's uh, said, thanks for a fantastic talk. You mentioned salinity being a threat to some areas. What would you say are the main drivers of that in those areas? Well, the main drivers have been clearing. Um, is certainly currently salinity's probably dropped off the radar a bit because of the dry seasons we've had, um, but it'll be still there. Um, if you go to Julemar, for example, there's a, been a quite a small amount of clearing in the central part of Julemar, but it's turned several of the um, streams there saline straight away. So you don't need much clearing in the eastern side of the Jarrah Forest to cause salinity to increase. So clearing's the key part. Revegetation, reforestation is the way to, in the recharge areas, is the way to lower this, but it needs to be much greater than we thought it first needed to be. We thought you could revegetate about 20%, but that just doesn't seem to work it. Some areas it'll have to be up to about 80% to make a difference. And the problem currently is with the dry years we've had, people have thought salinity has gone away, but it's not gone away. It's just waiting till we go back in. If we go to a wetter period again, the inertia that's driving salinity will just come roaring back again. 
and we haven't done the work to stop it in the time we had to do that. We've sort of dropped the ball, I feel. Hmm. Uh, so Kim's uh, said, you didn't mention ANSI Keen Dampland. Where does that <laughs> fit in with the importance of the wetlands? Hopefully I said that name right as well. <laughs> yep. Well, the ANSI Keen Damplands are probably different but equal to Brixton Street in terms of the um, diversity and um, really, yeah, they're a wonderful series of wetlands. Part of the reason they probably haven't featured as prominently is that the Urban Bushland Council and the Conservation Council and the Wildflower Society have spent many, many years trying to get those, um, which were largely private areas, into a consolidated reserve. So now that they are in a consolidated reserve, I'm sure studies on the, that area will show that it's of really, really high um, biodiversity significance. It's just a, a function of past history, not values, if that makes sense. Yeah, right. Uh, so Sue has said, um, not wanting to start a political conversation, but do you have any thoughts on who new starters can contact to protect these special areas? Good question, I think. Well, I guess contact either the Conservation Council they have, or the Urban Bushland Council, if you're talking about um, um, areas within the Perth metropolitan region. But certainly if you want to do something, contact the Conservation Council, Western Australia or the Urban Bushland um, Group. They've got more than enough to do. And if you want to volunteer, I'm sure they'd be more than happy to um, take you. <laughs> to, yes, to use your help. You don't need any knowledge or anything. You can learn on the job. <laughs> and which, you know, many people in our survey program have that um, you don't need, we keep telling everybody you don't need to know anything because you'll learn on the job. And that's the way to learn with other people who uh, know stuff and are passionate about the environment. So Conservation Council, Urban Bushland Council or the Wildflower Society, all of those will be more than happy to have some help. Perfect. Yeah, Sue's just said she's actually joined the UBC as a volunteer, so <laughs> that works out well then. <laughs> if anyone does have any more questions, please feel free to send them through before we start to wrap up. Um, I see Jones just asked, um, they've said that they're going to see Dr David Honey, I think so, the local MP, um, about the EPA changes coming up. Um, and wonder if they may use some of your material when they meet tomorrow and will acknowledge your words, of course. Sure, sure. Not a problem. Perfect. Thanks. Since I'm retired, I'm all free. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. If anyone here yeah, does have any more questions, please feel free. Lana's just said, thanks, Greg and Katie, a brilliant webinar. Thank you for that. Yeah, thanks, Katie. Thanks for the beginning so that we got to the end. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay we did have a few technical difficulties coming up but we got through and that's the that's the main part so Jones also just said many thanks Greg and thanks for the talk it was a fantastic talk it was um really great to have you on so thank you thank you so much for joining us especially in light of um World Wetlands Day I think it was a really good that we're lucky we could time it up nearly a month apart but we got it in the same month of February yes, so yes. I think it worked well <laughs> nothing like being a leap year yeah <laughs> exactly okay I think if we're all, all done right. the, we're all the questions we might wrap it up for a for a nice finish time yeah. of a thank day. you Katie but yeah, thank you, everybody. And thank you, everyone, again, for joining. We really appreciate the ongoing support. And it's great to see that we can see so many more people that are interested in the WA's environment and um, interested in protecting it too. Uh, and everyone will also get the links for the webinar uh, uploaded, recorded webinar. Uh, so, yeah, keep an eye out for your emails. And I hope to see everyone again for our March webinar, which will be with Kingsley Dixon. So please keep an eye out for that as well. But thank you, everyone. And thank you so much, Greg. That was fantastic. No worries. Thanks, Katie. Thanks. See you guys.